And so, uh, welcome back. That's just for the recording. And uh, the program for, for now is a visualization of data. So the 3D visualization. And we might actually not use the full 90 minutes for the 3D visualization. We might go a little bit faster because the topics we have afterwards might take a little bit more, uh, might, might take a little bit more time. So we want to have a little bit more time for that. Um, but the visualization nevertheless is a very, very important part because that's usually what you will see in, in your paper, right? So if you go in your paper, you want to have some nice visualization of your data. Uh, and we will show you how to plot that nicely in MATLAB, how to do it by hand and how to do it with the programs that we sup uh, supply you with or the, which are is actually just, you know, taking the MATLAB plotting routines and making it so that it out of the box looks pretty nice. But you can obviously do all of that uh, with not too much effort uh, just by yourself if you have different, um, if you have different opinions on how uh, things look like, uh, should look like. Um, and I will sh also show you a little bit about the exporting uh, bit of the Atom Probe data because very often what I do is I do not export my Atom Probe data image or the, da the images of the Atom positions as uh, rendered graphics, but rather as vector graphics. Uh, and the upside of that is that you can later go in and say, oh no, I didn't like uh, I didn't like the color or I didn't like. Uh, how this bit looks and you can go in and you can change the color of anything you want. You can, you know, move lines, you can easily make annotations. And that's actually really, really, um, that's actually really, really helpful. Um, but before we start today with the uh, visualization, uh, I just want to take up something uh, that we discussed yesterday uh, with, uh, um, with Andy London. Is Andy actually with us or is he... Okay, um, so um, one thing that maybe was a little bit left out in Andy's discussion is um, um, is detector pileups, and uh, I just want to show you what I mean by that and what kind of uh, implications detector pileups have. Um, and that's for therefore I have a data set here. So this right now is something I will just show you. So don't worry, you don't have the data, you don't need the data. It's just for for me to show. Um, to show uh, some of the detector pileup issues that we have with delay line detectors in general that um, do skew our um, data a little bit. So sometimes if you are very often, or I can actually always, when you look at your atom probe data and you look at the isotopic abundances that don't quite fit uh, the, uh, the natural abundances. And the reason for that is not that the uh, natural abundance in your uh, material is different from the Earth's natural abundance, is that we have an isotope effect in, a de in detector pileups. And let me just show you what I mean by that. Uh, and for that, I've got I've taken a steel data set just because it's it, it's a relatively simple data set, uh, and uh, iron has isotopic distributions where you have minor isotopes and major isotopes. Yeah, this comes into play much more if you have isotopes with very different abundances. Uh, and with that, I will just load in this data set, which is the steel data set, and create a mass spectrum for it. Just load isotope table and the color scheme. And now if we look at that, we can obviously have a look at the various iron isotopes. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to define uh, the iron isotope, not by the most abundant one, but by one of the minor peaks, okay? That's all done. So 
So if I now have a look at this peak here, which is the iron 58 peak, what you will see is that the minor peaks yeah, are a pretty good fit. So I'll leave it at that. But the major peak isn't. Yeah? So you can see that there is a little bit of difference. Uh, but now I can actually go a, a x is get current axis and a x dot y scale equals linear. So if I move my mass spectrum now to a linear scale, what you can see is that there is quite a fair bit of iron missing. Yeah? And uh, the reason for that is that, um, let me just go to the tablet. So the reason for that, e oh, great. Now my tablet drawing doesn't work properly. Sorry, uh, I wanted to draw on the tablet, but I have a bit of a problem there, so I'll have to jump back to this. So the problem with that here is that um, the detector uh, generally has a uh, dead time. So for about, depending on which detector you have, about five to 20 nanoseconds after an iron hits at the same position, the detector is blind. Yeah. Uh, no, no, Dita, it's not fitted to total area. It's fitted to, um, it's fitted to, uh, um, it's fitted to the peak heights. But now uh, here I'm assuming that the peaks for the, uh, for the different isotopes of the same element have the same shape. Um, and so what, ha so, uh, Dita's, uh, th Dita's actually, th so what uh, Dita is uh, throwing in is actually that if you have different peak uh, shapes, then the height is obviously not representative of the abundance. But you can also check it by just ranging the different isotopes uh, and seeing about seeing how many counts you have in the individual ranges. Uh, and then you will see a little bit less of a discrepancy here because, of course, some of the discrepancy is called by the f uh, caused by the fact that um, if we go here to the minor peaks. Uh, they have a little bit of background, but, uh, but you can see they don't have that much background, but they have a little bit of background. Yeah? Um, and um, so essentially what's happening, what's happening here is that very often um, two atoms of the same type, you know, if one leaves, it's uh, for a neighboring atom, it's more likely to leave as well, especially at certain kinks uh, on the tip. Uh, and so we register only one. Yeah? And this is obviously more probable for the major isotopes than for the minor isotopes. Yeah? And, and this, in, this includes a little bit of, a, uh, of an isotope bias um, in our atom probe data, which obviously uh, is not usually uh, accounted for when, um, it's not usually accounted for when you, do, um, when you do the kind of analysis that Andy did yesterday, where we just assume that, um, um, the isotope distribution would be perfectly reproduced. So what I, uh, what I, uh, what I did before obviously is we have a little bit of background here, but this is in log scale. So there is not a whole lot of background here. Yeah? And I'm assuming that these isotopes all have the same shape and you will actually find that for pretty much any, um, pretty much any element yeah? that there is a bit of an isotopic bias yeah? this is just something to keep in mind if you base your analysis on isotopes that actually the minor isotopes are a bit of a better estimate of how much of the uh, individual element you got than the major isotopes because there we have detector pileup effects um, these detector pileup effects will over the next coming years when we move away from TDC based systems to digitizer based systems will slowly become less. I don't know if they're going to vanish, but they're definitely going to become less. Yeah, but for now, this is something to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, I'll still, uh, I'll still copy all the commands into the, still copy all the commands into the chat. 
picture to Valentin, to everyone, um, so that you know how to play around with the axis a little bit, because you know that's always helpful. Sometimes you want to go to linear, sometimes you want to go to log. And I will clear my workspace again, and we will continue with the aluminium data set that we worked with yesterday. So let me just load in the POS file from the aluminium data set, or the EPOS file in this case. Uh, sorry that we didn't give you all the uh, accompanying information with the aluminium data set, but it's from a commercial project, so... Um, Okay, and obviously I should have didn't need to kick out the color scheme and the isotope table. And um, we don't need the iron list for now, but yeah, I'll create one if I need it. Um, by the way, if you look into the uh, toolbox files, uh, one thing you can see is there is an iron list APT. And that's something I've mentioned yesterday, which is a list that uh, Teresa Fuchs, one of my students, has made with all of the ions, um, with all of the ions that people have found in various uh, publications. And on the right side, you can see which publications they are. So we have a long list of the individual publications that uh, where these ions were observed. Um, and uh, we can use that also as a basis for the iron find algorithm. Uh, of course, then we have to be a little bit selective. Um, we have to be a little bit selective about which ions we take, because for example, uh, if you take C60 and you're trying to find all isotopic combinations of C60, then that's a lot of isotopic combinations. Yeah? But uh, we have that iron list and uh, uh, we use it if we need to. Uh, um, okay, and the last thing I need is the mass spec with the ranges. And I can get rid of, this is the super alloys one. Yeah. And let me just unblock that one. And so for visualization, we actually give you quite a few different options. So let me just, so again, uh, so some people had an, uh, uh, didn't, uh, quite uh, well maybe I haven't been as clear yesterday about where you need to click or what you need to select in here uh, in order for it to be the um, the mass spectrum so one thing you, you can do is if this is your current axis if when you load it that it is you can go ax equals get current axis so GCA stands for get current axis and if I then go axis dot children, you will see that the last one of the children, so this is all ordered, all of these, so all of our plots, all of our ranges, or the area plots are the ranges and the mass spectrum. Um, and then we have text for the range labels uh, and the stem plots, which are, which are the ions. And you can see the last one at the bottom, um, this is our mass spectrum. So I could also go spec equals, uh, axis dot children and uh, and is the last one and that would give me the same result right because it's the last one at the bottom yeah so this is our mass spectrum in case you have clicked at the wrong bits at some point uh, obviously it doesn't it's not necessarily always the last one so uh, just have a look just have a look with the, uh, by saying, okay, uh, give me all the axis children to see where it is, because it might not be the last one. It might be somewhere up here or wherever, but usually it's the first thing you create. So it's the last one then in here. Yeah. Um, okay, and um, if we have the mass spectrum um, loaded in, we can go um, pause, 
allocate ranges and decompose. Uh, and we will do both things. We will work with decomposed and not decomposed. And I've shown you yesterday already quickly um, what kind of implications that has. And basically, uh, we have two different ways that we want to plot things. So one is separated by species, and the other way is everything at once. Yeah. And um, and of course, we might want to clip uh, all of that, yeah. and so with that we can uh, we can visualize things. So here again, we have all of the uh, information that we need uh, as a table, and we will mostly work off of either the uh, either the the atomic information or the ionic information. Yeah. And I will actually start not with using our functions, but with using the built-in MATLAB function, so that you uh, uh, that you understand that what we give you is just a essentially. Uh, a script of what we would use for most of the time anyway. So I'll create a new figure and I'll actually create a variable f um, which contains the handle for that figure. Yeah, so we've got a new figure and there's nothing in that figure yet. Yeah. And we can create an axis and I'll just override the old axis um, Thing that I had because I don't need it for now or maybe I'll call it plot axis packs oh and uh, yesterday I said never never use uh, any uh, variable names you won't remember in half a year so because you will see if you code for a longer period of time you will see that the person that you do the documentation for is yourself because you will eventually look into code that's six years old from yourself and you'll go like, what the hell did I do? And the first time you look at your own code and you don't understand it anymore, that's when you become a good programmer because that's when you start properly commenting. Um, anyway, so we create a new axis and we'll create that axis in the figure F. I'm sorry, the figure F still has a nonsensical name. No. Oh yeah. And now we have an axis in here and we want to plot our 3D data into that axis. And we can do that using the scatter3 command and maybe I'll also the scatter group is going to be our plot or our visualization equals scatter three. So it's a three dimensional scatter plot and we have to have an X, a Y and a C. And I'm not going to do much apart from that. Uh, Renell, you should have gotten the ranged mass spectrum uh, as an email yesterday. If you don't have it, um, if you don't have it, talk to one of the hosts. They can make sure you get the, ma the ranged mass spectrum, okay? Um, also, if you are at some point stuck uh, and, and you're losing the... Uh, um, uh, and can't keep up anymore, talk to one of the co-hosts. We have breakout rooms in which you can go. Um, uh, so, uh, so we have breakout rooms in which you can go where they will give you one-on-one -on -one tutoring, okay? So that will make sure that you uh, one on one that they can work with you through your problems. And yes, Marcus, uh, I very much uh, agree with you that uh, if your pro if your code is not properly documented, that's uh, uh, if you don't understand your own code, that's uh, that's uh, then you definitely left the uh, the area of good practice. Yeah. But the thing is, when you start coding, very often it's a very explorative thing that you do, especially if you do scripting, like in Python, R, or MATLAB. You just go and do stuff and it, and it, it turns out great. And by the time you're finished, you don't remember exactly what it did at the beginning. And once you need to revisit all of that, that's when you become a good programmer because the next time you will definitely remember. It's just like with specimens in the lab. 
every one of us have has had a specimen mix up at some point in their career and uh, i guess that's when you become a good lab scientist uh, that notes everything down okay so we will go um pos.x this would obviously be everything but we want only pos everything that we had at pos dot dot x post dot atom equals uh, which one do we did we want to see i think silicon was pretty nice in there yeah and uh, we can then go and copy that three times over and obviously now it have x x x that's not what we want we want x y and c and what i want well i'm not going to change anything but that right now okay so that we can go into the scatter plot and change things around um for us to make the visualization a little bit nicer so right now it will just pop up uh with the scatter plot in With the scatter plot in such a way that it's fairly unstructured. Uh, and for some reason, I created a second axis, so maybe uh, I shouldn't have plotted, I should have plotted it in the old axis. Sorry, I'll delete that again and um, make sure that it's plotted in the axis that we wanted to have. And this is our plot. axis oh and now deleted the wrong axis okay i'll just recreate the figure again so f is our figure ah. then our plot axis is in here and then we can plot into that plot axis yeah, and what you can see right now is that uh, we have sort of blue circles that are atoms and I can go and rotate and it resizes as I rotate and it's uh, upside down. Yeah, and essentially what our programs do is nothing but flips, you know, setting up the visualization in a way that it's consistent and visually appealing. That's literally all there is to it. Yeah. In essence, it's just using those built-in visualization functions. And if we want to make this thing a little bit nicer, we can obviously go into the property inspector. And there we are presented with everything um, that we can change about our visualization. So the first thing I would usually probably do is, oh, come on, I don't want the numeric value. Why is that thing here? Anyway, so the first thing I would probably do in the axis is uh, make sure that um, uh, make sure that um, that the uh, that the axes are equal and uh, I can do that by typing axis equal axis equal with I not E and now you can see that our axis is actually uh, uh, is actually equal and now I've clicked on the figure so you can see now the figure we have it here uh, and the thing I usually uh, change about the figure is mostly the, the, the color. Uh, window appearance. So we can go and click at the white color or we can click no color, which means in the window it unfortunately appears black, which is a bit weird. Uh, but in this case, it would be just transparent. Uh, usually if I go into uh, Illustrator, Inkscape or something like that, then I will just delete the background anyway. But we'll make a white background in the figure 
and we want to give the figure a title uh, so we can go into So titles. Where's the figure title? There's gonna be some keyboard callbacks, common callbacks, uh, mouse pointer identifiers, maybe. Um, and I can give it a name, and the name would be silicon. Now, now I can see the figure is called silicon. And I can go into its children, and it only has one child, and that's the axis. And we can give the axis a title as well. And the axis title would be uh, silicon in this case. And the good thing about this is you can use tech. Yeah, you can use LaTeX. So uh, I could go, for example, and go silicon squared. Uh, if I go silicon squared, you can see it's a proper tech interpreter. Obviously, silicon squared doesn't make any sense, so we'll just remove it. Um, but you can write any tech thing, any techy thing that you want. Uh, um, and uh, when I go back to the, um, so now we're back at the axis, uh, and you can change the axis uh, from the of the axis. You can change the colors and so on and so forth. But what I want to do is go into the uh, scatter plot, which is our child. You can also do that by using the edit plot thing and click on the individual things. So now this is the figure. Now I've clicked on the axis and now I've clicked on the scatter plot. And here I can go and set the marker to, you know, to some stars, to some circles. That's what we had. And to some crosses, you know, there's, there's plenty of options. And we usually just use those dots. Uh, and uh, with those dots, we can actually say, okay, we want to have uh, a line or, and a face color. And right now it only has an edge color. And uh, the edge color would be, I don't know, let's make it green. Or let's make the edge color black. And let's give it a face color, which is green. And if we now go uh, and change the, the size, and that would be coordinate data. And there should be some size data somewhere. Ah, color and size data, there we go. And I can change the size to maybe at 100. And then you can see they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Maybe you make it 500. Uh, and now I make, give it a line width of 0.1 points. And um, if I zoom in, I should be able to see that Oh, sorry, they, they don't have any. I, choose the, I chose the wrong markers. So if you use those markers, then we can have a black rim, for example, and a green filling. Yeah. And these are the markers we, we usually use. Um, and this really gives you a lot of possibility to play around with the kind of visualization that you want to have. And all that we have done in the next couple of things that I'm going to show you is actually that we have taken, um, okay, now I lost the X is equal, that we've taken those commands and just wrapped it up in a nice way. But you can always go in into any of the displays that you're going to see and explore all of this with the property inspector uh, and make it look as nice as you want it to look. Okay, so uh, let me just copy the ones that I actually typed in the right way. 
send them to all of you. Um, but of course, uh, I've shown it to you yesterday already. We have convenience functions that, 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 that do that, that set the plot up in a nice way for you. So you can go scatter, uh, scatter plot post data. And then what you need to know is what kind of post file you have. Uh, then you need to know the species you want to plot. And we usually want to uh, start with maybe all of them. And I found out that on PC, I have to transpose uh, my matrix. And now I forgot the, the rest of the entries. There we go. Categories post.atom. And we want to display all of them with our color scheme and we want to maybe have a size of 36 And now you can see that we have all of them here nicely. And if your GPU is, if your GPU is large enough, uh, okay, maybe I should have taken a little bit smaller markers. Maybe we'll make them really small. And maybe I want to display at the most one uh, million atoms per uh, per thingy. And that makes it really fast. So if we have small markers, it will just be dots without any uh, without any rims. For larger markers, we'll have a fill color and the rim on the side, which makes it really nice for publications. Um, and from that on, we will usually just pick what we want to have, which uh, which uh, elements we want to visualize. And here, obviously, uh, the elements that are meaningful to visualize is probably silicon. Um, silicon, copper, zinc, maybe manganese. Uh, and so I will just redo that and don't plot everything, but I will just go in and uh, open those curly braces. And that's a so-called uh, cell array of characters, okay? And we wanted to have silicon. We wanted to have manganese and we'll plot it in that order by the way okay it's important especially you know if you want to do publications you want to have probably a, a certain order to your uh, um to your elements so silicon manganese remind me what else did i want silicon manganese copper yeah let's do three or uh I uh, and chromium, I think. Did I have chromium? No, not chromium. Maybe I'm getting signal. Anyway, we'll stick with the three then. Uh, for what I wanted to show you, that's enough. Um, and uh, I already showed you yesterday that uh, if you move one, the other ones are linked. Yeah? So if you want to have a publication where all of the uh, view orientations of your... Uh, um, all the view orientations of your uh, um, displays are linked. That's a very helpful thing to have. Uh, and now if you want to export it, the simplest way to do that is actually to go here on those uh, uh, marker uh, on, this, uh, on this toolbar here that's been present since I think MATLAB 2018 or 2019. So uh, the, newer, uh, the newer MATLAB versions. And there you can select to either use a copy as image. Uh, I can copy it as an image. And if I then uh, open some kind of image viewer, do I have coral drawn here? Let me have a look. I do have coral drawn, that's great.
I can go and create a new document, for example, a fear sheet, a four sheet, doesn't matter right now what it is, and then just go and paste it in. And you will see we have a nice image, but it is an image, uh, it is an image and not a vector graphic, which means I can't select any objects in here. Uh, but what I usually want to do for publications is actually go and I'll do that with manganese just because it will, uh, uh, let's do it with the silicon. I can go and do it as a vector graphic as well. So if I take the, the, the lower option, it goes as vector graphic. And uh, since there's quite a lot of dots in there, MATLAB will probably take a couple of seconds uh, to, uh, to export the vector graphic. And then I can go into um, then I can go into Coral Draw, and um, and paste it in, and I will be able to edit every single atom in here as a vector graphic uh, as a vector graphic object. me out of some reason it kicked me out of the uh okay i think you can you hear me again uh, for some reason now uh during the copying process i got kicked out of um, I got kicked out of the, the, the Zoom uh, screen sharing. Oh. Sorry, uh, I got kicked out of the Zoom screen sharing for some reason. Uh, anyway, so um, here you can see that every single, uh, every single atom is an object in here. Yeah. If you have a lot of atoms, that's obviously taking quite some processing power. This is why I will close Coral Draw again. Um, but if you have smaller visualizations, that's usually the way to go. Also, I personally have found that uh, Coral Draw is not particularly good in handling very large, uh, very large vector graphics. Adobe Illustrator is actually fairly decent at doing that. I haven't tried Inkscape. If you have any, uh, if you have any, um, if you've got any. Uh, experiences with Inkscape, obviously I'd be curious to know about that. Anyway, um, you can, so you can go and you can copy all of that as a vector graphic, which means everything remains edi uh, editable. So you can edit anything you see here on the screen, so you can remove uh, backgrounds, you can uh, change the font, you can change the font size, uh, you can resize things, um, you can change line widths, and this all remains edi editable. And this is especially important for publications where, you know, uh, your boss would come in later and tell you, hey, I want this, but, you know, the line width doesn't match. Or we've decided to change all of the colors and you would have to go back into your, uh, into your data, replot everything, and this way you can just go in and change the color. Stuff like that. And that really makes your life a whole lot easier. So what I've done right now is I've plotted all of them in the same, um, I've plotted all of them in the same um, window, uh, but as separate axes. Uh, you can, by the way, you can switch on the, uh, for individual axes, you can switch on the legends, uh, but since you only have one individual plot in each, uh, in each axis uh, and the title is at the top, you know, it doesn't really matter all that much because you already know this is silicon, this is manganese, this is copper. But uh, very often we also want to plot all of that, uh, all of our data in one um, thing. And in this case, we would go and we would probably start with one. You can also start with an empty axis, doesn't really matter. But we may, might want to start with just silicon. Okay, we might want to just start with silicon. And... Um, we might want to just start with silicon and uh, we want to maybe plot the copper with the silicon. So what we can do is we can go 
And oops, I should have done it a little bit differently. Um, by using the plot. So by creating a variable also, yeah, so we now have uh, the plot as a variable. Yeah, just like we had before as a figure handle. And then I can take that figure handle and plug it into here. And plot it in that specific axis. Yeah? And, uh, and the plot handler, so that the, the scatter plot parent is actually the axis we want to plot into. And now I can go and plot the copper in there. And now we have the silicon and the copper plotted in one, uh, plotted in one plot. And what you can see here is that probably uh, we have, uh, so probably this was uh, electro polished and we had some uh, copper deposition on the top of the sample. So you might want to cut that out. Uh, this usually happens if you dip, if you electro polish and you dip your uh, copper tube a little bit into the electrolyte, you can easily get copper deposition through galvanic displacement, which obviously doesn't influence the data inside. So this is not some FIP damage or anything. This is just copper deposition. And let me just copy all of that into the chat again. So if you do not have the ability to have tiled layout, that's a, an issue with your MATLAB version. So the tiled layouts that we're using here, they were introduced not that long ago. I think it was 2019A. I would have to Google that. Let me have a look. At the bottom, it always says when it was introduced. So the tile layouts were introduced in 2019B. So if your uh, MATLAB is older than 2019B, then you will not have the tile layouts. Um, but you can obviously still use the, the regular scatter plot. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty film, 2019A. So you can still use the regular scatter plot, uh, obviously. Um, yeah. And here you can also uh, put in the legend and here you can see the legend already pops up uh, with the silicon and the copper. So if I go um, AX equals get current access, AX dot children, and we'll go uh, AX dot children, we'll look in, it doesn't matter in the first or the second one, they're both scatter plots dot, um, display name, you can see the display name is actually um, whatever species it is that we're trying to plot. Right now we're trying to plot atomic species, but it also works for ionic species. So if I go BOSS decompose, and I'll show you that in a second, then we're also able to go and uh, plot ionic species very easily. Now, one thing that you see with MATLAB, and this is a little bit unfortunate, is that the depth buffering is not super consistent. So you can see as I rotate, uh, sometimes the, the silicon is a bit more in the foreground and sometimes the copper is a bit more in the foreground. Yeah. This is a bit of an issue, especially if you want to do animations and I'll show in animations in a second. Um, yeah. Um, but it is, um, that's nothing, there's, that's, there's nothing that I can really do about that. Yeah. But, but because uh, this is probably the more realistic um, way to display it. But that's very often why we display them, you know, in separate axes. But you can do that with as many things as you want. And you'll see later we can also add other objects to it. So we can add regions of interest to it. We can add isosurfaces to it and so on and so forth. So a lot of your analysis setup will exist as MATLAB graphics objects in that figure. Uh, and you can save it as that and you can load it as that. Um, okay, and I already mentioned animations. So we have a, a very simple way of doing that. So you can go um, um, 
movie create turntable animation. Uh, and there we want a frame at each degree. We want a frame rate of 30 FPS. And we want to call the file uh, test movie dot AVI. It's an AVI movie. And what happens then is that uh, it starts rotating um, our axis based on our initial view, okay? So you can set whatever view you want and it will rotate about that view, yeah? Uh, and it will do so um, in one full rotation, so up to 360 degrees. And then it will create a movie called testmovie.avi, which I can open outside MATLAB Did it? Oh, there we go. VLC media player. And it creates a very nice and compact and high quality movie um, in a uh, very simple manner. Okay, so this was now for uh, obviously for uh, multiple plots in one thing. And maybe I'll open it again, open outside MATLAB. And it has the one thing that at some point, you know, you will see this artifact where it jumps between uh, the individual uh, elements being in the foreground or the background. And unfortunately, there's nothing I can do to force it to do any, anything else. Apart from putting actual spheres at the atomic positions, which will make it a lot, le lot less efficient. Um, and uh, show in Explorer, and I think this, the file sizes are pretty reasonable. So it's uh, 100 megabytes is not super reasonable, but it's okay. Um, and you can, by the way, go in and you can uh, you can request a higher compression. So if you go open movie create turntable animation. You will see that we also have uh, video quality and frame rate and so on and so forth. So this is a very short script. Uh, so you can change the, the video quality to a lower setting. Then you have higher compression, you have smaller uh, video files. But I think in 2020, uh, the video file size is not as important anymore as it used to be. Uh, let me just copy it in. Copy, paste, and um, you can also do that with multiple, um, with a larger figure. So I'll just show you that with, uh, let's put the, so maybe you want to do it here. And then you can see uh, it does it for the three at once. Uh, unfortunately, there's one thing that's a little bit unfortunate about that, and that is that it tries to resize the windows according to the rotation, uh, which is a little bit annoying. So obviously we would have to, um, yeah, uh, which is a little bit annoying. Unfortunately, I have not found any way to force it to keep the axes always at the same size. Uh, if you go with fixed tile layouts, I think that might be possible. Um, but uh, in this case, we have the, the little issue that it will start resizing this one during the, during the movie making. Again, this is something that I haven't gotten a really good answer from MathWorks yet. Uh, but I hope that in the near future I can fix that so that they always ch stay the same size during the rotation and that it doesn't have this weird, you know, bouncy bumping, uh, pumping effect that you can see here. Uh, but very often, so if you would just take the silicon and the manganese, it would just make a very nice movie uh, of, the two, uh, of the two side by side.
the possible to rotate the data in a certain orientation uh, um, uh, like the side view. Yes, it's, it's very much possible. So let me just show you how to do that. That's what I meant with, uh, let's just take the copper. Close that one, close that one. Oh, I just followed the copper into the other axis again. It's just created in a new window. So yes, it's very much possible. So you can go to X, uh, to XC view, for example, and go uh, movie create turntable animation. And now you can see it rotates about the Z axis. So you can use side views, you can use top views. Uh, by the way, if you use side views, then uh, obviously the effect that I showed you just before, I, I wanted to give you a, you know, worst case scenario, so, but maybe I should also show, show the, the nicer scenarios as well. So if we go to, uh, not X, Y, to X, Y view, and then you go movie create turntable animation, then obviously this effect of it resizing is, uh, not very strong at all. Uh, it's still there, but you know, it's something I definitely want to get rid of. Um, and I hope I will be able to get rid of in the uh, near future. Okay. So that's it for the, um, for the simple visualization. The next thing we might want to do is actually crop our data. Yeah. So, um, you know, this, uh, for now we wanted to show the whole data set and very often that's, that's what we want. But also very often, equally often, we want to have a section of the data displayed. And we can also very easily do that. And I will first show you the version with doing it with a little widget that we have. And the next, uh, and, and then I will show you just how to do that programmatically. So not very, uh, not very hard either. So I will just um, plot the copper data again. Yeah, so I will just plot the copper data again. And then I uh, will just open the cropping app. I just need to write cropping and it will pop up with a little MATLAB app for that. And let me just copy all of this stuff that I did. Uh, da, 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 da. And now what you can do is uh, you can go and say, uh, get current axis. So it will take the axis here and read out what the X min, X max, and so on and so forth is. And then you can enable and disable cropping. Yeah. And there will also be a little bit of a jump ahead because you can create regions of interest from your crop. And this is just axial cropping, right? So there's no, you can't tilt anything. It's just really X, Y, Z cropping. Um, and I don't know, maybe in the future I will add so cropping in different directions as well. I think this would also be, uh, be really helpful. Uh, anyway, so I can, for example, go and enable the X cropping and then just simply move through my cropped volume and the X span is five nanometers right now. I could make it 10 nanometers and just move through the cropped volume. Yeah. Uh, I can obviously also do that with Y, but now we've only got a very tiny bit that we've cropped. Um, and X, Y, and C cropping uh, works the same way. And you can separately enable uh, the various cropping ways. Obviously now we're in a very small box where we don't really have a lot of stuff. Oops, 200 doesn't make much sense. And we're not really cropping much anymore. So now we're in a 10 by 20 by 20, obviously exactly somewhere where there's not a lot of uh, copper. Yeah. So now we're there uh, relatively high cropping level. At that level, you might want to make your, uh, your uh, you might want to click on on the copper again and maybe make it a little bit larger. So you can go to color and size data and we'll maybe make it 30 dots large or maybe 100 dots large or something like that so that we can see things a little bit better. 
and we can move through our um, we can move through our data set. So, and one thing we can then do is in the app, we can go and create a region of interest based on our crop. So if you've been cropping your data and you think, geez, this is really the volume I want to focus on, then you can create a region of interest object. Uh, and you, you, you can give that a name. So I'll just change the name to test underscore or test crop and then click Roy from crop and you can see we now have some box uh, and if I go and leave that again maybe I'll make the uh, size data a little bit smaller again maybe five. Um, and what you can see now is that we have a little box in here and uh, this box is actually exactly where we had our cropping so if i re-establish the cropping you'll see we only see the box yeah? and if i zoom out again you can see the box is in there and the box is a region of interest object and the region of interest object is just very simply a um, uh, a matlab patch object a patch object means it's a an object that represents 3d geometry in terms of vertices and faces with the vertices being uh, the corner points here and the faces between being the the uh well the faces between them obviously and um this object now um ex exists here as a patch object as well so i can go into the uh, test crop object for example and let me just maybe dock the figure so that you can see uh, all of the stuff that is happening while it is happening and I want the command window maybe side by side uh, and so I can for example now go and go test crop dot face color and maybe I don't want it red maybe I want it blue now it's blue maybe i wanted you know some gray grayish color that would be 0 0.8 0 0.8 0 0.8 you know 80 percent of each color and now it's grayish uh, and also usually we make it relatively transparent right so you can see it has a high high level of transparency so if i go test crop dot face alpha you can see it's 50 percent transparent i can obviously set that to one then it's oops then it's intransparent uh, or i can say set it to point one and it's very transparent and apparently it changes the the visualization of the scatter plots also along uh, with the transparency the most important thing is we can do a lot of stuff with the region of interest object and you will see that when we get to cropping and region of interest um, because you can move it around you can uh, use it obviously to crop stuff you can use it obviously to crop stuff and you can use it for analysis and you can already see on our box shaped roi so we have different shaped ROIs. we have got cylinders um with the region of interest now you can change the axis orientation you can, uh, but we'll get to that in the next lecture okay in the next lecture we'll go into details of cropping regions of interest and so on and so forth um and how to use that for analysis and what you can see is you can see that you know also on the major figure we also have we have red green and blue axes and this is sort of a convention in computer graphics that you have RGB as the colors, which stands for X, uh, X, Y, and C coordinates. You will find the same thing in Ivers, by the way, in any of the other visualization programs that use that kind of color scheme, that RGB is X, Y, Z. So red is the X axis, green is the Y axis, and blue is the Z axis. And the same thing here, you can see on the global axis, we've got the blue Z axis, the red X axis, and the green Y axis. And the same thing on the, uh, on the uh, box here.
Do I recommend the uh, colored axis in published figures? I don't know. That's your preference. Um, if you, if I think it's uh, more important that people know what your measurement axis was, if you have crop data, than it is to how you call your axis, because it's 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 essentially completely um, up to us which axis we call x, which one y, and which one z. But yeah, I, I usually do it. I usually uh, include the colored um, axes in the figures. Uh, if you don't want them colored, obviously you can just click on the uh, axes, uh, go into the properties inspector, and um, then um, change the, 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 the change the colors of the axes to maybe black, black, black. But I personally, you know, it's it's a preference. Can we can we have a vote on that? Who likes uh, pre uh, press on the green button if you like color? I know that's a loaded question. Maybe press on the green button if you like <laughs> if you like the black. But it, there's there's no real answer to that. So uh, I personally like it colored. So I will go with red, green, and uh, red, green, and blue. But that's obviously uh, that's obviously a preference. Yeah. But we also have that on the um, on our region of interest object and you can uh, obviously select it. So if you, sp if you save your figure and you want to reload your region of interest object, you can click on it and go GCO for get current object, or you can go into, um, uh, or you can go into the axis and, pl and, and have a look what the axis children are. And you will see that, you know, that this object has the name. Uh, so if I go, Test crop dot no not delete function display name you will see it's called test crop so it's easy to find and if you go into test crop dot user data you will see that we have an ROI x axis y axis and z axis uh, which we then can use for analysis. And if we go, if we just plot, the ROI X axis, you can see that the first one is the origin of the axis and the second one is the uh, end of the axis. So if we look at this, at the X, uh, at the red bar here, then the first uh, coordinate here would be uh, this point and the second coordinate would be this point. Uh, so we can use that for the uh, for the analysis later. Good, and uh, that's actually it uh, for the most part for the visualization itself. Um, obviously, you can save the figure as is, and this kind of also saves your uh, your visualization and later when we have ISO surfaces and we obviously have a region of interest now, uh, it also includes all of those objects, all of the information in the objects um, and you can pull that out again. One thing I just realized I have not done with the regions of interest, uh, at least not as it, as it a is added in this case, is that there should be a uh, test crop dot user data dot plot type field which says region of interest. This is still missing, um, and um, uh, this is something we put in. Uh, can your code include a length bar to the figure then? Um, yes and no. So obviously the uh, the scale bar is uh, what you have here. Yeah. So this is displaying a scale bar. On a raw uh, axis, it's a little bit hard to do that because if you change the axis size you would also change the size of the scale bar. Um, so I usually um, go and export it as a vector graphic and then just in my vector graphic program, draw a line from here to here. Can you use the crop box as a scale bar? Yes, Tita, that's a very good point. Obviously, since you know how large the, the box is, you can use the scale bar as a box. And uh, scale bars in Atom Probe are always a little bit problematic anyway because you have co you, you have 
you know, you have a view. Uh, and right now we're always going in orthographic views, but you can go away from orthographic views into perspective views. And then a scale bar doesn't make as much sense anymore. But yes, Dieter, it, it's a very good point. You can actually use the crop box or a fake or, or a region of interest. So with the crop box, obviously this has, this has some crooked dimensions. I don't remember how large I made the, the crop. Oh no, it's 20 nanometers. So yeah, it's pretty well defined. But you can also just put in a region of interest object that is 20 nanometers in size. And then you have a then you have an appropriate scale bar as well. Uh, but what I usually do is uh, what I usually do is I leave the uh, I leave the the annotations on and then just use them. Yeah. Obviously, if you have a paper and you make the figure relatively small, then the annotations don't usually uh, have that much space available. So usually I then just leave one dominant axis and just leave the coordinate uh, coordinates here. Can we process an RGB color map or heat map for a particular element? Yes, you can absolutely do that. So one thing I haven't shown you uh, because uh, we haven't integrated it really into um, um, into the toolbox per se, but you can relatively easily do is, for example, you could go into the, um, let me just close that again and remove the region of interest. Um, so one thing you can do very easily is that if you go into uh, the scatter plot, what you can see is there is a color data field. And right now this is just one color. But what you can do is, for example, go um let me just get this scatter plot so the scatter plot is pl equals get current object um and i can go pl dot c data equals post dot uh what do we want to use uh, probably a coordinate, not the coordinate, but maybe the master charge. We can use the master charge for post dot atom equals copper. And if we now go into here, PL dot C data. Oh no, is it C data source? Sorry, my bad. It's C data source. Oh no. Okay, I've done this before, so I don't know why it, uh, uh, X data, C data, Or maybe we should do it as the size data. Oh, because we've uh, pre-allocated the the markers with the color. But we can, for example, change the plot so that the the size is dependent on. Um, on the mass to charge ratio or the uh, the color is dependent on the mass to charge ratio. Obviously, since they all have pretty much the same mass to charge, all of the copper atoms, you don't see a lot of difference. But the color, you know, you can change the color scheme. I oh, know it's already aligned with the color scheme here. Why? So colors. OK. But uh, yeah, it's a um, it's a good it's a good point. You can actually use, for example, the master charge ratio or something like that to color your atoms, so that you can see maybe where the single charged ones are and where the double charged ones are. Or um, if you just look at one peak, 
what it, Adam saw that at a peak uh, maximum and what Adam saw that at a peak tail, but you can definitely do things like that. And this is, you know, one of the upsides of having sort of an open system like that, that you can come up with crazy ideas like that, that maybe uh, you want to see, you know, which atoms or uh, if there's a particular atoms that have, that come off later during the pulse, stuff like that. Oh. So this is definitely something you can, uh, you can look into uh, very easily. Okay. Um, and, okay, I just want to do that now. Let's do that. Okay, let's do that. So let's go and open a figure again. Uh, open F equals figure. And uh, um, plot axis is an axis in that figure. And in that plot axis, we'll go scatter scatter. So okay, where did I use my last scatter plot? Scatter to scatter three. Oh, okay, I called it viz. Viz equals scatter three, and now with the silicon. And we can go and set the uh, C data. So we can go C data. And the color data is then post.mc. And we want to have. Did I, did I do something wrong? Post .ed. Oh, my bad. Obviously, we want that to be the same here. And now you can see that we have some differently colored atoms here, depending on what mass to charge we have. So we have uh, the, uh, the very light ones are obviously silicon plus whereas here we have silicon two plus but maybe we want to change the range so that we can just look at the silicon peak itself the silicon two plus peak and maybe see which atoms are lower in the peak and which ones are higher and let's just uh, for that purpose uh, change the uh, change it to some kind of dot display and we can edit the color bar so we can go edit uh, color map and it's the perula color map and we might maybe want to have that end at 14.5 or something like that and you can see that obviously we have some maybe we want to have a different color map as well which color map do we want to have edit Standard color map, maybe the, I like the jet color map usually. Or maybe standard color map, maybe we have some HSV. No, because then everything becomes red. Okay, maybe the Perula color map wasn't actually that bad. And what you can do now in this uh, in this plot, obviously, is you can look at which atoms are uh, coming off, sort of which atoms are coming off as two plus and which ones coming off as one plus. And let me just post all of that, oh, but only the ones that worked, only only the ones that worked. Copy, paste, yeah. And because you've got uh, full freedom, you can obviously 
um, you know, come up with all kinds of crazy things uh, that really help you gain some insight into your atom probe data. Very often what we do, for example, is uh, you can, cr for example, create a field desorption map for one plus versus two plus. Yeah? So sort of heat maps of uh, what the charge state ratio is locally, things like that. And we will actually look into that in, uh, in uh, one of the later sessions. Tighten up the C axis limits. Uh, yes, we can absolutely do that. We can go and do our axis equal command again, for example, and do all kinds of uh, visualization cleanups. Yeah. But what you can see is definitely that most of the, um, most of the atoms are doubly charged. Um, but you can also use categorical names and, and things like that. Uh, because there is a so-called group scatter plot, uh, so you can uh, go and G scatter, group scatter plot, and then you can use uh, the categories uh, of the atoms. So you can use postal atom in the group scatter plot, and it will automatically give you a scatter plot with all the different um, elements and everything uh, correctly uh, correctly built up. But we uh, still manage that ourselves because. Um, uh, of the subtleties I was talking about before. So now uh, this was all atomic, but obviously we can also do that on a per ion basis. And that's the last thing I want to show you in this session. And that is plotting on a per ion basis. So we can go pos equals pos undecompose pos So if we now get into our pos variable, so you can uh, you can see that um, we only have the ion defined and not the um, uh, and not the individual atoms, and our plotting uh, routines will actually know that. Yeah. So uh, we can go scatter plot pos data and pos. So categories of pos.ion. And now I won't be fooled again. So now I color of the molecule is not in the color scheme. Bummer. Okay, which one isn't in the color scheme? Let's just uh, have a look. Categories. Iron, aluminum hydride probably and silicon oxide. Uh, Martina, do you have a color scheme that you can quickly send me or, um, or push into the test data that has those ions in there? Otherwise, I'll have to fill them out. I mean, what you would do is just create a new one. Oh yeah. Let's do it the proper way. Hydride. What do, what else do we need? Aluminium H two, aluminium H three, and silicon oxide. Okay, that one we already had. and paste that one we already had and then we should be able to do our plotting uh, and what you can see now is that we have plotted by ion but not by charge state okay uh, we haven't, 
uh, you need to actually request an ion with a specific charge state to plot the charge state on top of just the ion. And what you can see here now is that in the plot, you can actually see that we have the aluminum hydride, the aluminum H2, and wherever is the ion is actually a monoatomic ion, it will actually say, okay, this is the silicon ion and not the silicon atom, yeah? because that makes a difference, because the silicon atom would consist out of data from the silicon um, from the silicon ion and the silicon oxide, because obviously the silicon oxide positions also contain a silicon atom. Yeah? And the same thing for oxygen, manganese, uh, and so on and so forth. So for all of the different elemental ions, it will just say aluminum ion. This is, by the way, the case also when we when we do uh, concentration plots. Uh, we had concentration ionic concentration plots as well. And if you do plots there, it will also say aluminum ion concentration and, you know, ionic concentrations. So um, this is uh, this is something uh, to bear in mind. Obviously, you can go back into the color scheme and you can change the colors as you like. OK, and with that, we are actually finished with the visualization for now. Uh, for the last couple of minutes, uh, do we have any questions? Do, do, or do you have anything that you want to see? That uh, Any special trick, any visualization that you're really keen on, on having yourself that you think could just easily be done? Or is everyone already tired? I'm still very proud of all of you that still uh, so many of you uh, have made it through all the... Um, to all the, the hard bits in the beginning. And trust me, from now on, it just gets easier. Right? It just gets easier. Uh, plot by charge state ratio. What do you mean by plot by charge state ratio? Because an individual atom doesn't have a charge state ratio. Or do you mean plot individual charge states? So later when we look into uh, 2D analysis, 3D analysis, I will show you how to do make charge state ratio plots or 1D analysis, you can make charge state ratio plots. But um, for, a single, for a single atom, charge state ratio doesn't make sense. But I can show you how to, for example, just plot uh, silicon one plus or something like that. Yeah, I think this makes a lot more sense. Um, and... Um, by the way, if you uh, had an axis, a scatter plot like before, so if I go, um, if I go, uh, it was bigger, an axis, uh, what, what did I call the other axis, a plot axis. And then scatter three. Oh, no. What was it? This. And we'll do it without the color scheme now. So maybe I'll, t in this case, I want to pre filter it. So I'll just say um, silicon. Underscore plus uh, because we can't use uh, special characters as variable names is pos pos dot atom equals silicon and pos dot charge state, oh, we don't have, sorry, post dot ion is silicon, and post dot charge state equals two. And all entries thereof. And now we get a variable of about 71,000 atoms that is just silicon two plus. Yeah. And, um, I 
I can use that and scatter upload post data. And in this case, uh, we want to have the silicon underscore P. Obviously, you can do it the manual way as well. And we want to, in this case, it doesn't make sense to display anything but the silicon, but we'll just still have to write silicon. And then we get a silicon atom map of just the silicon 2 plus. Yes, Florent, you're absolutely correct. It should be post.in. Sorry, I, uh, you probably wrote that before I changed it around. Thank you for the, um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, what you can obviously also do is uh, put all of this here in the, uh, in the command if you don't want to create a separate If you don't want to create a separate variable, you could just take all of this here and put it in here. And then we obviously also still only want to plot silicon. And that would do the exact same thing just without creating a separate variable. And don't be afraid of long code lines like this um, because you can reuse them quite a lot. You, know? you can uh, extensively use the, uh, the command history and just autocomplete, autocomplete, autocomplete. Uh, okay, so uh, that's it then for the visualization. Um, can I have some green thumbs from everyone that could follow, that was able to follow properly? I'm always happy if it's people that are not from Erlangen, but that's a lot of green, uh, that's a lot of green thumbs. So that's, uh, that's very good. Okay. So with that, I'll uh, stop the uh, recording. Uh, I'll stop the recording for this session and I will upload it to YouTube straight away. The other videos are up uploaded already as well. And uh, according to the program, I think we have a... Uh, we again have a half an hour break and I'll see you again in half an hour. Obviously I will be in the, uh, I will be in the zoom meeting, a zoom chat for most of the half an hour.